Again, welcome. Um, looks like mostly home folk here uh, recognize most of the faces, but for those who ultimately be watching on YouTube, uh, my name is Doug Resevens. I'm chairman of the Deacons. Uh, I'm here this morning because uh, pastor's on his annual pilgrimage down to Kevin Harris's church in uh, Kentucky. So please be in prayer for him and Deborah as they travel and as uh, uh, he leads services down there. Uh, part of the uh, duties of the chairman of the deacon uh, is to fill in when the pastor is not available. So as uh, he goes on these uh, annual uh, pilgrimages, uh, these conferences he does, it uh, uh, becomes incumbent upon the, the deacon body to provide the, the message in his absence. Um, pastor normally gives me two weeks notice. I uh, said that publicly just a, a little while ago, so he came to me and he says, uh, I heard you say you, I only give you two weeks notice. I'm giving you two months notice. So two weeks notice seems a little short. Um, two months notice is a little too long, right? It's the old procrastinist attitude. Why put off till tomorrow, which you can delay until next week. So I had all this time to think, what message should I bring? What should we talk about? It's always difficult to, to come up with a topic. Pastor never tells me what to preach. He doesn't tell the other deacons what to teach. Sunday school teachers, he doesn't tell us what to teach, uh, except uh, you know, this month we're in the stewardship lesson, we do that in September. Other than that, he leaves it up to us. As long as we're biblical, he's good with it, and, and I truly appreciate that. But again, the difficulty is what to talk about. So in all this time, I'm thinking, hmm, well, let's look at the headlines. Let's find something uh, uh, relevant to today. I mean, we've all been through COVID, that's one thing. Um, you check the headlines, and what do you find? You find natural disasters, crime, economic uncertainty, unemployment, persecution, violence, terrorism, wars, conflicts, division, disease, death. I think that list touches us all in some manner or another. So what do I talk about? Do I pick one of those? Do I talk about all of them? Do I talk about none of them? Two months is a long time to decide, so finally dawned on me. In Sunday school, we, uh, my class has been studying Psalm 119. We've just finished up a section. Psalm 119 is divided up into the various stanzas. We just finished a section that I think is very relevant uh, to all these topics, and it's relevant to everybody. Um, I did apologize to my Sunday school class this morning. I told them to pray for themselves because they have to listen to me for two hours today instead of just the one. What I'm going to talk about um, took us about six hours in Sunday school to discuss. So I hope you're all comfortable and brought a lunch. <clears throat> so Psalm 119, it's very easy to find. If you look in your Bible, if you take away the table of contents, you take away maps, concordance, any other indices you have in there, you take away any commentary, Psalm 119 is exactly dead center of the Bible. It is uh, the longest uh, um, psalm in the Bible, has 176 verses. It's also the longest chapter in the Bible. The psalm is divided into 22 stanzas. Each one of those 22 stanzas uh, is uh, representing a Hebrew character. Uh, most of your Bibles will actually uh, have either the Hebrew character or an anglicized version or pronunciation of that character. Uh, separating the stanzas. Each stanza is separated into eight verses, and in the Hebrew, each one of those uh, verses is of the same letter as the section. So if this was in English, for instance, the, the first eight verses would start with the letter A, and every line uh, in uh, the first eight verses would be A, and then the next one would be B, C, etc. Obviously, in English, each line doesn't begin with the, the first letter. It's very difficult to translate from the Hebrew to do that. As I've told my kids in, in their studies of uh, foreign languages, the, the biggest problem with foreign languages is they have a different word for everything. The writer of Psalm 119 is not exactly known. Uh, a lot of people believe it's David, and I'll get into that. Um, we do know the earthly writers of a lot of the other psalms. Uh, for instance, Psalm 90 is noted as a prayer of Moses. Psalm 72 states as a psalm of Solomon. Psalm 50 and 73 through 83 are psalms of Asaph. The, uh, psalm 73, sorry, there's 73 psalms that are described as psalms of David. 
There's also 14 other psalms that have various attributions to different authors. That leaves 61 psalms with no attribution of authorship, Psalm 119 being one of those. Rabbi Joseph uh, Muraf of the uh, Magdalene David uh, Shaparic congregation in Rockville, Maryland, makes a compelling argument that David is actually the earthly author of Psalm 119. These are the points that he makes. Number one, based on tradition, the rabbis of the Talmud and the Mishra maintain that David was the author. Secondly, as I've presented, the psalm is, is an acrostic where the first letters are all, uh, the, the, the first letters of, of the verses are all the same as the chapter. We don't see that anywhere else except in other psalms attributed to David. Uh, David also in other psalms refers to himself as your servant and a stranger in the land. The author of Psalm 119 is, is the only other place that uh, this, is, this is used. Uh, the themes of Psalm 119 also bear striking resemblances to David's words in Psalm 18, 19, 25, and 86. And in Psalm 119, the author uh, claims that he sits around and talks uh, with noblemen. He speaks God's testimonies in the presence of kings. He, he says he's experienced suffering and been unjustly persecuted. And these are all very reminiscent of, of David's life. So thus considered together, there is a strong argument that can be made in favor of, D, of David being the author of Psalm 119. So please keep that in mind as, as we go through this. If you turn to Psalm 119, uh, we're gonna look at verses 81 through 88. And what we're going to see here is the psalmist is seeking liberation from three things. He's seeking liberation from his sins, from his foes, and from his fears. As we read God's word, watch for the following themes. In verse 81 through 83, the psalmist expresses his depression arising from his mortal fra uh, failness. In verse 84 through 87, he expresses anguish due to undue persecution. And throughout the psalm, he refers to God's word as a source, a source of joy and comfort. So Psalm 119, verse 81 through 88. And uh, just before I begin, as a side note, I will be in the King James or the New King James. I'll be swapping back and forth. Sometimes the King James can be a, a little bit of a tongue twister. But uh, unless I give a reference, it will be uh, the New King James. Psalm 119, verse 81, my soul faints for your salvation, but I hope in your word. My eyes fail from searching your word, saying, when will you comfort me? For I have become like a wineskin in smoke, yet I do not forget your statutes. How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? The proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. All your commandments are faithful, they persecutely wrong me, help me. They almost made an end of me on earth, but I did not forsake your precepts. Revive me according to your loving kindness so that I may keep your testimony of your mouth. So in verse 81, we see the first complaint. My soul faints for your salvation. Strong's Concordance gives alternate meanings for the word faints. It says it's perish, taken away, or to be destroyed. If we look at other uh, translations, the New Living Translation says, I am worn out. The English Standard Version says, my soul longs. The uh, New English Translation says, I desperately long for your deliverance. The New American Standard Bible says, my soul languishes for your salvation. So obviously here we see a desperation. He says, I'm worn out, my soul is fainting. Hebrews 12.3 warns us not to be wearied and be faint in your minds. Now normally weariness and fainting are referred to as deficiencies of the body. Weariness being the lesser and fainting being a greater deficiency. When we're weary, the functions of the body are dulled, but they can typically be revived through rest or nourishment. Fainting, on the other hand, leaves the body senseless and for all intents of appearances, lifeless. When a man is weary, his strength is decreased, but when he faints, he is given his all. So in verse 81, the psalmist is trying to communicate that spiritually he's progressed beyond weariness and he's on the verge of utter collapse. He can barely hold on any longer. 
He's waiting for something. What is he waiting? What is he holding on for? It says there at the end of that verse, but I hope in your word. He's waiting upon his salvation. This struggle is uh, talked about in Romans chapter 6 and verse 6 through 7. It says, knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. For he that is dead is freed from sin. Thus, through Christ, we are freed from sin. But from the Amplified Bible in Romans 7.15 says, For I do not understand my own actions. I am baffled. I am bewildered by them. I do not practice what I want to do, but I am doing the very thing I hate and yielding by human nature to my worldliness and my sinful capacity. And then in Romans 7.24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver this body from death? This is the internal war that we fight every day between the soul and the sin. Those who seek after God can find it extremely wearying and David has found it exhausting. So the psalmist has reached the lowest point of his condition and anguish, yet he is faithful and trusting to God's word. In at the end of verse 81, we see an eagerness of expectation and an energy of hope because he writes, but I hope in your word. And there is a promise in God's word. That's the promise. When we consider the word hope, what does it mean? I looked it up in a dictionary. It says to look forward with a desire and reasonable confidence, to believe, to desire, or to trust. The older archaic meaning is to have confidence in. Hebrews 11.1 now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And Romans 8.24 says, For we are saved in this hope, but hope that is not seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? Hope is the very foundation of our Christian faith. Why do we hope? Why do we have confidence? Because God has said so. He's put it in his word. God cannot break his promises. Okay, that's a sermon for next time. I need to note that. Yet, the certainty, this hope, does not quench the desire for a speedy answer to prayer. We all know Proverbs 13.12. It says, hope deferreth make the, maketh the heart sick. But you remember the rest of that verse. Hope deferreth maketh the heart sick. But when the desire cometh, it is the tree of life. Think of that. Have any of you ever traveled? Ever taken a bus, a plane, a train? I'm sure most of you have. I've spent most of my career traveling. I remember one time when I was traveling in the winter months, I had a connection through a major hub and uh, happened to be in the middle of a snowstorm. Managed to get into the airport, managed to get to my connecting flight. We boarded, sat down, pushed back from the gate, taxied out to the runway, and they closed the airport because of the falling snow. Uh, we were told that there's no gate to return to because of all the inbound flights, so there we sat in the taxiway and sat and sat and watched the snow build up on the wings. I was heading out to the, uh, the west coast. And we actually sat on the tarmac much longer than the entire flight would have taken. Hope maketh the heart sick. Sat there watching the snow build up, watching the snow plows go by and the snow blowing in behind them. Could look out the window and could see the terminal. Could have been in there. It would have been nice and warm and we could have had food and could have watched TV. Could have done things. We're stuck on this plane. Finally, the snow started lessening. You could see out the windows, the snow plows were making progress. They came and de-iced our plane, actually did it a couple of times. Then came those sweet words. This is your captain speaking. We're next in line for takeoff. Hope maketh the heart sick, but when the desire comes, it is the tree of life. I can tell you that wait, though it was annoying, was over, it was forgotten, there was anticipation in getting to our destination. And this is what the psalmist is saying. Though he's about to expire, he still has hope in the Lord. Isaiah 25, 9 says, and it, will be, uh, and it will be said in that day, Behold, this is our God. 
We have waited for him, and he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited on him. We will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Carrying on in verse 82, Psalm 119. It says, My eyes fail for thy word, saying, When wilt thou comfort me? Again, looking at some other translations, the English Standard Version says, My eyes long for your promise. The Good News Translation says, My eyes are tired from watching. The Christian Standard Bible says, My eyes grow weary. The Contemporary English Bible says, I am worn out from waiting. And the New English, sorry, the New Living Translation says, My eyes are straining to see your promises come true. Can I paraphrase? God, I'm not seeing it. When will this end? Have you ever been in a situation that just seems hopeless? Doesn't seem to be getting better? Maybe you went from the frying pan to the fire? You ever been there? I'm sure we've all been there at one time or another. Like the psalmist, we have to have hope. I have hope in God. I have faith. The psalmist's eyes gave out eagerly seeking for the appearance of the Lord, and his heart cried out for a speedy comfort. Let us be careful not to complain to God. Sorry, let us be careful to complain to God, but not complain about God. If we complain about God, this can cause resentment, doubt, and backsliding. However, when we complain to God, it breeds faith, hope, and patience. In his affliction, the, palmist, uh, the, the psalmist still turns to God for his comfort and says, When will thou comfort me? And his gaze is constantly upon the Lord, for my eyes fail for thy word. In Luke 2, verses 25 through 32, there's an account of someone who actually waited their whole life for God's promise to come true. Luke 2, 25, And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon, and the same man was, was just and devout, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Ghost was upon him. And it was revealed unto him by the Holy Ghost that he should not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. And he came by the Spirit to the temple, and when the parents brought in the, uh, the uh, child Jesus to do for him after the custom of the law, then he took him up in his arms and blessed God, saying, Lord, now letteth thou servants depart in peace, according to thy word, for my eyes have seen thy salvation, which thou hast prepared for the face of all people, a light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of the, thy people Israel. Simeon was promised God to see God's salvation, and he saw it. He saw Jesus face to face. It was a lifetime wait. And when he had that prayer answered, he said, Lord, I'm ready to come home. So the burning question is, how long must the weary exercise patience? Lord, when wilt thou? Well, the answer to this can have, well, there can be different answers. Perhaps God will provide relief when the grief that we're going through has served its purpose. Ever heard the saying, practice makes perfect? Why do coaches make you run laps? Why do your music teachers make you play scales? Now, you wouldn't know it looking at me today, but I used to play soccer. Loved, loved, loved playing the matches. Practices, not so much. When I was much younger, I also played the viola and the trumpet. Okay, not simultaneously, but concurrently. It's <laughs> kind of weird. I really enjoyed the performance. Can't say my audiences did, however, but I despise the practice, and that's largely why I don't play today. God may also delay in providing relief to increase our faith, increase our patience. Have you considered that some trials come as a result of our poverty of belief, while other trials come because of the comfort that we enjoy? In our comfort, sometimes we forget God, and sometimes we need to be recentered. Maybe God's waiting for us to forsake our sins. Maybe he's waiting for us to submit or obey to his will. Or maybe the delay in answered prayer could simply be a matter of God's timing and the needs of others. 
2 Peter 3.9 says, The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us, not, not willing that any should perish, but all should come to repentance. Regardless, we do need to exercise patience and wait on God's timing. Carrying on in Psalm 119, verse 83, the psalmist says, For I have become like a wineskin in smoke, yet I do not forget your statutes. It's kind of an odd um, verse there, a wineskin in smoke. Traditionally, wineskins, when they were emptied, were hung up in the tent, and due to the burning fires within, the, the, the skins grew black and sooty, and due to the heat, because they were uh, raised up in the tent, they became uh, wrinkled and dried out. Such a wineskin essentially became useless. And the psalmist is alluding to this as his whole body being in sympathy with his sorrowing mind, having become like an old worn out wineskin bottle, which could hold nothing and now answered no purpose. This is a true picture of sin, one that we have to be careful not to fall into. Matthew 5.13 says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. Verse 83 says, Yet I do not forget your statutes. Here is the patience, and this is the victory in faith. The worst circumstances cannot destroy the believer's hold upon God. Yes, God's people have their trials. But Christian, in time of trouble, do not forget God's word. Do not forget God's commandments. And do not forget his promises. Ponder this for a moment. Is a trial really a trial if we don't feel it? If we don't feel like an old wineskin in smoke, are we going to benefit from this? Is God really using that for our benefit? Though it's not biblical, remember the old adage, no pain, no gain. Then looking in verses uh, 80, uh, 84 through 87, David complains that his enemies, in contempt of God's law, are, are plotting against him. He testifies that God's commandments are true and faithful and guide those who follow them in the path of uh, peace and safety. And like David, we can expect help from God when we suffer for abiding in God's instructions. At times, it does seem that the wicked almost consume the believer upon the earth. However, we should always depend upon the grace of God for our strength in everything we do. So in verse 84, David writes, How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? Now, it's possible to treat uh, this verse in, in one of two different ways. You could look at the stanzas as separate stanzas. The first one being, how many are the days of your servant? That could uh, generally be looked at as a complaint of the brevity of life. Um, and we have uh, similar instances in other Psalms where that's discussed. And then the next verse would be, when will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? That would be a prayer to God to take vengeance upon the Psalmist's enemies. However, if you take the two together, how many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? It can be seen as a complaint of David's sufferings have been protracted too long, and therefore he naturally desires that his plight might be brought to a swift termination. Regardless, David continues to place his faith in God. He does have a faith that there will be an end to his afflictions, <clears throat> and he asks God for perfect judgment. Luke 18, we see Jesus tells of the parable of the persistent widow. Luke 18, 1, then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart, saying, there was a certain judge in a city who did not fear God nor regard men. Now there was a widow in that city, and when she came to him saying, get justice from me for my adversary, he would not for a while. But after a while he said to within himself, Though I do not fear God, nor regard man, and yet because this widow troubles me, I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me. The Lord said, Hear what the unjust judge said, and shall not God avenge his, uh, avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, 
though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, he will, uh, will he really find faith on the earth? David asks in verse 84, How many are the days of your servant? When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? There in Luke 18, our Lord tells us, Pray and do not lose heart. David continues in verse 85, The proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. Well, when we read the account of David's life, we find that his foes were continually trying to entrap him. They were very industrious, they were very cunning, and they were always trying to ruin him. They figuratively digged pits for him. And as, as the psalmist says in 85, verse 85, the proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. David's enemies should have been ashamed for what they were doing. Instead, they were proud. David calls them here. They were proud. The proud have dug pits for me. Now, it is lawful or was lawful for hunters to dig pits and set traps for wild animals. However, by Levitical laws, it was not legal to dig a pit and leave it open so that a tame animal might fall in. To, ne to neglect the exercise of caution in this regard was at the peril of the one who dug the pit. Exodus 21.33 says, If a man opens a pit, or if a man digs a pit and does not cover it, and an ox or donkey fall in it, the owner of the pit shall make it good, and he shall give money to, the, uh, to their owner, but the dead animal is his. So uncovered pits are cruel and contrary to the commandment that Jesus gave to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandment than these. Now, fortunately for David, David's enemies were also enemies of God. Therefore, their attacks had no sanction on David. Even though their plots and schemes made his walk uncomfortable, we must always be mindful that we do have an adversary who is planning ambushes and cunningly placing traps in our ways. We can remember Job. Satan asked God's permission to harm Job. Luke 22, 31, and the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed, Satan has asked for you that he may sift you as wheat. In 1 Peter 5, verses 8 and 9, we are told, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a, a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Resist him steadfast in faith. So there's comfort in God's righteous judgment. <clears throat> In God's judgments, the wicked are typically snared in their own traps. Psalm 7, uh, verses 14 through 16 says, Behold, the wicked bring forth iniquity, yes, as he con conceives trouble and brings forth falsehood, that he made a pit and dug it out, and has fallen into the ditch which he made. His trouble shall return upon his own head, and the violent dealing shall come down upon his crown. Remember Joseph, his brothers in a fit of jealousy threw him into a pit and sold him into slavery. But then in Genesis 50 verse 20, Joseph says to his brothers, but as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good in order to bring about as for this day to save as many people alive. And in, and back in Psalm 119 verse 86, all your commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongly, help me. So we see the psalmist, though he is complaining about things being done to him unjustly, he finds no fault in God's law. Instead, he lays the fault with his persecutors. David has not done any injury to anybody, nor has he acted outside of God's law. Therefore, he can confidently appeal to God, help thou me. This is the simplest yet most effective prayer, Lord, help me. God's help is our hope. And if God is for us, who can be against us? David carries on in verse 
87, they almost made an end of me, or they almost consumed me upon the earth, but I did not forget thy precepts. So David wrote, they almost consumed me. I can relate to that. True story. I once stood face to face in front of two full-grown male lions that had previously killed and devoured 135 men. My wife's looking at me, what, when? I mean, I stood there, not two foot away. I saw their big fangs. I saw their sharp claws. I was so close, I could see my reflection in their eyeballs. And there I stood, looking them eye to eye. They could have reached out and taken my life. They could have consumed me. They almost consumed me. I could have been number 136. They had already done it to 135 other men. Except this pair had been shot by John Harry Patterson in 1898. They made a movie about these lions. It's called The Ghost in the Darkness. You can go stand where I was and see them yourself. They're down in the basement of the Chicago Field Museum. They had almost consumed me upon the earth. The psalmist is declaring his fears. Well, what is fear? Well, we all know the verses that state fear the Lord. That's, that's a reverent fear. That's not the fear the psalmist is referring to here. The type of fear that David is talking about is defined by Webster's as an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of impending danger, evil, or pain. Another source defines fear as a feeling induced by a perceived danger or threat that ultimately leads to a change in behavior. Using the letters of the word itself, some refer to his fear, F-E-A-R, as false evidence appearing real. Fear. Now, fear is not always bad. God's actually provided us an instinctive level of fear that protects us, makes you get out of the way of a careening car, makes you avoid a poisonous snake, keeps most of us from performing risky actions. Okay. The psalmist isn't expressing this type of fear either. His cry, they almost consume me, comes from our mind and emotions. Now, every time I go to my doctor for a checkup, they always ask me about my allergies. And I do have allergies. There are certain things that I have severe negative reactions to. So when they ask me about my allergies, I always say, doctors in pain. For some reason, they never write it down on my chart. Now, many of our fears have no basis in reality. Sometimes they are figments of our imagination, usually uh, produce apprehension, and in extreme cases may produce paralysis of activity. The root of the majority of fears is the unknown and the perception of loss, or the combination of the two, namely the apprehension of death. Franklin Roosevelt said, the only thing we have to fear is fear itself. Marie Curie said, nothing in life is to be feared, it is only to be understood. And then there's the old German proverb that affirms, fear makes the wolf bigger than he really is. Fear has a twin sibling, it's known as worry. Worry takes a potential happening from the future and causes paralysis in the present. What you worry about may or may not happen, but worry can create an anxiety level as if it were really happening now. Fear and worry are the enemy's most commonly used and probably the most effective weapon used against us. It can make us ineffective in matters of the kingdom. Now remember, I started out, I gave a list of things I considered talking about. Well, I'm actually talking about them all, right? But uh, we listed natural disasters, crime, economic uncertainty, unemployment, persecution, violence, terrorism, wars, conflicts, division, disease, death. Who has not had a worry or fear about any of those? Dare I say we all have. Now, fear and worry are not easy to overcome. 
really it comes down to our choice. Choosing whether or not to allow fear and anxiety to control us, choosing to guard your heart, and choosing to guard, guard your mind. We may still feel afraid, but we know that God is with us. And we not, may not be in control, but we can trust the one who is. We may not know the future, but God does. Again, David said, they almost made an end of me on earth, but I, uh, but I did not forsake your precepts. And what precepts is David referring to here? Well, I've not counted them myself, but uh, in my reading, I've uh, found references that say, fear not, and ones that are very similar, appear in a Bible over a hundred times. Again, this doesn't include the instances where fear is clearly referring to a reverential fear of God. If elsewhere in the Bible, uh, our Lord repeats himself so we get the point. For example, when Jesus says, verily, verily, I say unto you, if I can paraphrase that, he's saying, hey guys, listen up, this is really important. If he repeats himself in that manner, then if God repeats himself over a hundred times, maybe we should pay attention. And what should we be paying attention to? Philippians 4, 6 says, Be anxious for nothing, for, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be, be known to God. Matthew 6, 27 from the Amplified Bible. And who of you by worrying can add one hour length of life to his life? 1 Peter 5, 6, and 7. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Cast all your anxieties upon him because he cares for you. Psalm 55 says, My heart is in anguish within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. Fear and trembling beset me. I call to God, and the Lord saves me. Evening, morning, and noon, I cry out in distress, and he hears my voice. He rescues the unharmed. Isaiah 41.9 uh, sorry, Isaiah 41, verses 9, 10, and 13 says, I have chosen you, and I have not rejected you, so do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. For I am the Lord your God, who takes hold of your right hand and says to you, Do not fear, I will help you. We have Zephaniah chapter 3, Never again will you fear any harm. The Lord is your God. He is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. 2 Corinthians 12, verses 8 through 10. Three times I, that's, that's uh, Paul, pleaded with the Lord to take it, that was the thorn in his side, away from me. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weakness, in insults, in, hard, in hardship, in persecution, in difficulty. For when I am weak, then I am strong. And Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, an everlasting help in, in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, he makes war cease. He says, be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord Almighty is with us, and God of Jacob is our fortress. One commentator I read summed up verse 87 in Psalm 119 as, although we may pass through many fires, God is our asbestos covering. And finally, verse 88. The psalmist writes, Revive me according to your loving kindness, so that I may keep your testimonies of your mouth. Revive me, whereas in the King James it says, Quicken me according to your loving kindness. God's loving kindness is a source of our spiritual revival. It is the rest and the sustenance that we, re we need to recover uh, from when we are weary. However, when we are quickened, we are able to bear much affliction. When quickened by the Holy Spirit, we are able to exhibit a holy character. 
Though it seems in the previous seven verses the psalmist has complained about his condition, here in verse 88, we do not see him praying from freedom from trial, but rather he is beseeching God for renewed life that he may be supported under these trials. Like the psalmist, we should remember that God will never allow us to walk through difficulties without allowing it to bring a greater hope and purpose. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18, though outwardly we are wasting away, there's that wineskin in the smoke uh, uh, illustration again, yet inwardly we are being renewed day by day, for our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is, is eternal. Remember, we can have victory and peace through Jesus. John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. And also because we are comforted through Christ, that we are able to comfort and minister to others. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 4 and 5 who comforts us in all troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. For just as we share abundantly in the sufferings of Christ, also our comfort abounds through Christ. Because of Christ, we learn greater perseverance, strength, and endurance through suffering. James 1, verse 2 and 3 says, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds, because you know that the testing of your faith produces perseverance. Now, no one wishes for hard times. No one wishes for sufferings. No one suffers for trials and tribulations. Maybe this is why God reminds us that trials are part of our journey with him. It makes us stronger. It gives us endurance. But most of all, it increases our faith. Though it may seem counterintuitive, we are told that during our, our suffering, we must rejoice. The enemy wants to do nothing but defeat us and to discourage us, make us ineffective in battle. We can choose, and choice is the operative word. If we choose to rejoice in our, tri in our times of difficulty, we are overcomers in Christ. 1 Peter 4, verses 12 and 13 says, Behold, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeals amongst you, for which comes upon you for your testing, as though through some strange thing were happening to you. But to the degree that you share the sufferings of Christ, keep on rejoicing. And we must always be careful to remember that Christ is at work. It's his power that works within us. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 and, uh, through 9, But we have this treasure in jars of clay, that's our earthly bodies, to show that this is all surpassing power is from God and not from us. We are hard pressed on every side, not crushed, perplexed, but not in despair, persecuted, but not abandoned, struck down, but not destroyed. And finally, when everything passes, we will come out as gold. Job 23.10 says, But he knows the way I take, and when he has tested me, I will come forth as gold. Now remember, an oyster does not produce a pearl except it experiences some sort of irritation. Diamonds of great beauty and worth are produced by extreme heat and pressure. And the purest gold must go through the refiner's fire. And depending upon where that gold started, it may have to go through the fire several times. God knows our ways. and We're not meant to be stuck in, in suffering and pain and trials. We only need pass through it. God reminds us when we come out the other side, we will be changed. We will be better. We will never be the same again. Okay, audience participation time, pop quiz. So an orange, what happens if I was to put a lot of pressure and squeeze this orange? What's going to happen? I'm not going to do it, it's going to make a mess. <laughs> what would happen? What am I going to get? I'm going to get orange juice, right? Imagine that, orange from an orange juice. Uh, sorry, orange juice from an orange. This is a lemon. 
What happens if I was to squeeze this? I'm going to get lemon juice. Again, there's a surprise. Lemon juice from a lemon. This is an apple. What happens if I squeeze this? Now, I'm going to have to put a lot more pressure on this than I would the orange or the lemon. But if I squeeze this really hard, what am I going to get? I hear apple juice. That's the answer I'm looking for. Someone said applesauce. That's true as well. So, all common answers to a simple question, right? But is that the correct answer? The correct answer to what happens when you squeeze something, the correct answer is you will get out of it whatever is inside of it. So the question is, when we go through trials, what happens to you? You've heard the saying, this too may pass. It's not biblical. My daughter called me up and said she found uh, this poster. And uh, she didn't photograph it. Her phone was low on batteries. But uh, she said, this poster said, this too shall pass. It may pass like a kidney stone, but this too shall pass. So Christian, when trials and problems squeeze you, what happens? Whatever is inside you comes out. Does the world see Christ in you? Let us pray. Hi, my name is John Blair, and I have the privilege of being the pastor here at Coventry Baptist Church in Fort Wayne, Indiana. I want to thank you for choosing to take part in our online services. I sincerely hope they were a blessing to you, and I want to invite you to continue to use them in the weeks yet ahead. In fact, take your time on our website, check it out, let us know what you think about it. Your opinion is very important to us, and we'd like to have some feedback. Let me take this time to also extend an invitation to you. If you don't already have a church home, let me invite you to come to our church and take part in one of our weekly services. Our morning worship service on Sunday is at 10 a.m. Our Sunday night service is at 6 p.m. And our Wednesday services and our midweek service is at 7 o'clock p.m. We're located at 10926 Aboit Center Road. We're right across the street from Homestead High School. Uh, just get on our website. We have a detailed map and some instructions on how to get here. Again, thank you for choosing our website and our services. I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you. I hope to see you this Sunday. Let's be the time.